Good evening. My name is Edie Lush. I'm really delighted to be here with you tonight. We're going to let people join for the next, let's see, one-ish minute. So I'll give an introduction to myself in a moment, but in case you don't know already, my name is Edie Lush. If you would like to keep in touch during, after this event, please don't hesitate to email me or contact me on any of the um, social media sites, the one you like the most or hate the least, whichever one. Um, so I will give a little introduction to myself while we wait for folks to join. Uh, I live in London. I originally came to the UK 22 years ago. I originally came from California, um, but I moved here to be a political analyst for UBS. And I very quickly, well, not very quickly, but after a couple of years, I actually realized that I much preferred speaking about uh, politics and economics rather than writing about them. So I went to Bloomberg Television. I covered politics and economics there. Uh, I then went to the Week magazine and the Spectator magazine. Uh, I was writing the city pages there. Uh, and I then, um, I still do a lot of journalism, so I work for a group called Hub Culture. Uh, I do interviews uh, at places like the World Economic Forum, uh, places like and the COP Climate Summits. Um, and sort of half of what I do is journalism, so I emcee a lot of events. I'm emceeing an event tomorrow on artificial intelligence, all online in this digital world. Uh, and I... Um, and then the other half of what I do is help other people open their mouths. So anything, it could be from speaking on a panel or giving a keynote address to a big conference. It could be managing, hosting meetings online. Uh, it could be just having one-to-one -one conversations, either managing upwards to your boss or trying to manage uh, a, a team, and whether that's digital or physical. So that is an introduction to me. Now, um, I've been asked to give you some information. So here's the information I've been asked to give you. So I'll speak for about probably 45 minutes, and we will have 15 minutes for Q&A at the end. Uh, I have been told that you're all incredibly well behaved and you know how to use these things but um, you're all muted. Sadly, you don't have your video on, which is a shame because I would love to see you. Uh, but if you do have something you want to share, put it in the chat. If you've got a question for me, uh, put it in the, the Q&A session. And I will keep uh, an eye on that as we go. What I, would love to, um, what I would love to know from you guys, first of all, is where are you joining from? You can put this, by the way, in the chat. Uh, so just tell me where you are, what part of the world uh, you're, you're coming in from. And I'd also love to know what you, um, what you find difficult about this new world or this hybrid world in which we are communicating sometimes in person, but quite a lot of time we're communicating over screens. So I'd love to, to hear from you uh, what what challenges you might be having. If it's a real question, um, then pop it in the, the Q&A. If there's something you'd just love to share, uh, just, just pop it in, in that chat. But I can see that we've got people coming from all over the world, which is absolutely fantastic. Now, let me check to see if there's anything else I was supposed to mention. Um, yeah, ask the questions um, via the Q&A and vote for the ones you want to hear um, via the um, via that q and I think that's it. Yep, I've got all, all that. Okay, so I'm seeing some really interesting things coming in already. Building trust digitally, um, people switching off the camera and doing whatever. Absolutely. Uh, so let's get cracking. I think that what happens um, all over all over the world, what happens whether you are in person or, um, or on screen is that it can be very difficult to build a relationship, right? I am right now in transmission mode. I can't see you, I can't hear you, I can't read your faces. Uh, so I have no idea what's going on, right? Now that isn't something that's even actually even particularly new. What I think happens um, 
whenever we are under the pressure of the need to deliver, when we're in the spotlight, is that we can mutate from the interesting uh, person that our friends and family all recognize to something that doesn't really feel like us. It can feel drier, more technical. We might go down rabbit holes of detail. We might forget the message. We might, uh, we might actually just lose track. I had a client once who said, you know, I came off of a webinar the other day and I felt like I had been kidnapped by aliens. So I just didn't even, I, I didn't even recognize that person um, that I saw. So what I think happens is that um, something very, shall I say, ancient happens. I think that um, we have to think about what an audience wants. Now this can be an audience that is digital, right? Or it could be an audience that is a hybrid audience. So I'm going to Saudi Arabia in a couple of weeks. I'm doing an, an event, I'm emceeing an event where there's 50 people socially distanced in the room and another 500 people on screen. So I think that we need to think about what audiences want both in this world in which we're all two dimensional, uh, just on a screen and a world in which we're going, which we will have some people two dimensional and some other people 3D. Right now, there is some very old research on this subject by a guy called Albert Moravian. Now, this research is so old, it's from the 1970s. What he discovered was that um, in the, for the written word, 90% of a book you might read, an email you might send, something like that, 90% of the impact of it comes from the content. Right? It comes from the words on the page, not too surprising. Only 10% of the impact from that written word comes from what it looks like, the font, the margins, the spelling, that kind of thing. Now I'm gonna put up another, what do you think this looks like for the spoken word? What percentage of the impact of your words comes from the content, comes from what you say? Have a, um, put, pop your answer in the chat. Seventy percent, fifty percent, thirty-five. Okay, Adam has got it pretty close. Uh, in fact, it's seven and a half percent. So only seven and a half percent of what I'm saying, or the impact of what I'm saying, is coming from the content. We will be generous, and we'll call it ten percent. So 80% is what you see. You see. Um, that's a guess from Elliot. It turns out that it's around 60% of the impact of is what you see. Uh, what do you think the other 30% comes from? What else has impact from my spoken word? The tone. Yeah, absolutely. The tone of voice. Or putting it another way, what you hear. So is Edie sounding interesting? Does she sound passionate about what she's saying? Does she sound like she wants to be here? Or does she sound a little bit bored? Or does she sound like she's just speaking in one tone the whole time? Right? So there's not only what I, um, what, how I look. Do I look interested? Do I look happy to be here? But also that tone of voice. And if you think about putting this into this new digital content or context, when quite often on a video call, I'll turn my camera off, then I've only got that voice, right? It's the same if we were, you know, back in the day when we used to just do conference calls, uh, it was just the voice. So what's really important to think about in this digital world is uh, is not only the content, right? So I'm not telling you that what you say is not important. Of course it is, it's 100% important. You guys know your stuff. You wouldn't be here if you didn't have something to say. What I am saying is that it can get lost in what other people are seeing and hearing. So tell me if this sounds familiar. So I think that what we have to have is some kind of energy. 
And in fact, the screen tends to take away the energy, just as people in the room can take away the energy. So I think we need something. If I had come in today and said, I'm really excited to be here with you, really looking forward to it. Oh my God, what don't I have? Pop it in the chat. Exactly. Energy, passion, any kind of interest, you guys, enthusiasm, really good words. So I like this idea of performance energy because it can feel sometimes when you're on screen, even when you're in person uh, at a presentation, it can feel like something you have to put on. It, feel, it can feel a little awkward. Uh, but tell me if this sounds familiar. You are starting a presentation and you're giving your first point and you just notice three people turning off their cameras. <gasps> and you think, oh God, what did I do? Am I being really boring? You get back on track. You get another, uh, you, you make another point and you just notice that people have left the call. You think, oh my God, what is going on? It can be like this all the way through. Somebody might ask a question you're not ready to answer, that you don't know the answer to. So I think that our energy can move around all the time in these moments on screen. Up here, I think that we're being memorable and interesting. Maybe down here, what's happening to our messages? What happens if your energy takes a dive during one of these calls? If you find yourself going off track, what happens do you think to your messages? Exactly. They just don't land. They just don't land with the audience. So if 0%, that's maybe before the alarm clock goes off in the morning, up here at 100% uh, at is where I'd put maybe certain talk show hosts in America, not where I'm asking you to be. Somewhere around 70% is what it takes to be memorable and interesting. I call it being in the zone. So if this is our tank of energy below this pink line, I think it has a leak. And I think in the digital format, it can just be the camera, right? Because I'm looking at the moment at a green dot. Can't see anything, right? It can be incredibly draining, especially if I don't know what I'm gonna say or I feel quite nervous. In real life, it's also draining, right? I think, in fact, there's some research by a woman, uh, a professor at Yale University called Marianne LaFrance, and she has done research on speakers. She's found that it's even more stressful to speak in front of an audience who's giving nothing back than it is to speak to an audience who's heckling you, who's shouting at you. So it sends that testosterone level uh, down, your ability to take risks, and it sends the cortisol levels up. So you get much more stressed, much more stressed in front of an audience who's giving nothing back than you even do to somebody that's shouting. So I think that's fascinating. So I think we need some tech, oh, I like to call these guys the energy vampires. So whether they are driven, uh, whether they are happening on screen or whether they're happening in person, um, I do think that it is, um, it's tough. I totally agree, by the way, Carlos, that there are some places where the culture is to not engage, the culture is to actually walk out of the room. I've totally been there. But I do believe that you will keep more people with you if you keep that energy up. So, I think we need some techniques to keep topping up our energy all the way through a presentation. This can be digitally or it could even be in person. I'm demonstrating one technique right now. What am I doing?
smiling, hands, I am looking at the green dot. Yep, I'm making eye contact. Yes, and I'm asking questions according to the audience, and I am pausing. Exactly right. I love a pause. Tell me some of the things that you think are useful about a pause. Pop those in the chat. As you do that, yes. So about hooking the, the listener. I was once speaking to um, a, an audience at South by Southwest. I had just published my book. I was pretty excited, but I was also nervous. And I looked out at the audience and I thought, gosh, there is one guy sitting there on his phone like this. And I thought, you know, I have nothing to lose. I said to the audience, let's find out how long a pause has to be to bring everyone back to the room. And do you know what? It was the longest seven seconds of my entire life because we all sat there and after seven seconds, this guy looked up, realized we were waiting for him. I would got him. So I think you guys have definitely, definitely got there too. So um, I think that the other thing that pause can do for the speaker, it can allow you a chance to think about whether you've made that point, whether you need all those words, so if people have told you in the past, listen, you need to slow down, you're speaking too quickly. The answer is not to slow down. Actually, you'll find if you practice putting some pauses in, you'll be able to allow your mind to catch up. I think you're also completely right that people have to reflect on what you've said. You have to give them time to let it sink in. And even beyond that, I think that what a pause can do is it turns, it can turn a, a diatribe, a transmission of, an, of information into actually what feels like a conversation. And if you can see, I'm even doing it now. So I'm asking questions. I'm pausing, I'm allowing for some feedback to come through in the chat. And even though it's odd, it's a little bizarre, I can't see you, I can feel that you're engaged. And I can also see when people aren't getting it. It's easier, of course, if you have a, a Zoom room uh, where you see you're seeing the audience. So in a pause, when people's videos are on, you can have a look not only at the camera, but look around the room and check in. And it's also a good moment to make sure they come back to you. Because if they hear that silence, they can always, uh, they might think, mm, did somebody ask me a question? So that's a little bit about the energy side. I really divide communication into two halves. The first is the, the how you say it. So do I look and sound confident, comfortable? Is there anything detracting from what I'm saying? The second half is that content, that 90, that 10% that's left. So once we take care of the, of the 90%, then we focus on the 10%. So I believe that if you walk away with one thing from the energy side, have it be the pause. And my advice for you is if you'd like to practice it or any of the other techniques I'll go through, take one technique at a time. And tomorrow for every video conference you have, every conversation you have, every networking moment you have, just take one technique and try that. So, there are some other techniques, however, and I like them. Uh, there's five techniques that I, I think are the, the heart of good energy. This idea of, of dynamic energy um, or performance energy, I think you can, keep them, uh, you can keep them on one hand. 
Now I say five fingers because most people have five fingers. You know, I've trained a bunch of people in the last year who don't have five fingers. I had, I went actually just before lockdown, I was training in a refugee camp in Kenya and I met a girl with six fingers. Uh, and then I trained another woman a few months ago who had lost a finger in an accident. She had four. Generally, five fingers, so I have five techniques. So that first finger, posture, eye, eye contact, smiling, and using the hands. These are all the things that you guys noticed that I was doing. So on a screen, right, it can be very odd to think about, well, how do I use my hands? Because if they're up here, that looks weird, right? So I would suggest um, that you get yourself in a situation where you are looking directly at the camera. Make sure you're sitting with your shoulders back and down. Have the camera positioned so that it's the chest up so that you can use your hands because it ends up looking more engaging. Now, if you think, what are these weird bananas doing on the end of my arms? I don't know how to use them. Um, just try one at a time. Uh, just try, imagine you are cutting through butter with your hand. Or imagine you are moving it through water. So a slow hand movement is easier to watch than that kind of thing, right? The sort of, I don't know what that is, throwing pizzas maybe. So, but one hand can open you up or you can use two. Uh, so there's some neuroscience behind this. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of Amy Cuddy. Um, she's done a lot of work around the types of positions we put ourselves in and the effect it has on the brain. And it turns out that, um, glad, I'm glad Rubina likes her work. Uh, it turns out that um, when we actually stand up with our shoulders back and open up uh, as speakers, but also as students, uh, as, as anyone walking around, we send different hormones to our brain. So we send the, the cortisol level levels down, we send the testosterone up. Now my, probably my biggest, the, the thing I use more than anything is this idea of posture. If I am doing a pitch to a client online, if I am emceeing an event, if I am just having a conversation that I want to make sure I am giving my best focus and giving myself the best chance to appear sound and be confident and comfortable, I will stand up. So um, I have two positions in my office. I have one that's for right now where, uh, I'm sitting down. I have another position in my office where I'm standing up. Uh, and that standing up is, in, is so useful for moments that you need to be on your best foot. Now it's hard to do that all day, right? So <laughs> when I'm emceeing an event, I do stand up. Uh, and then and the parts, parts that I take a break, I make sure to, to sit back down. Also think about your chair. Uh, I'm actually not in the best chair. So this is a chair that can move around. What's the danger if, if you see a lot of that in, in somebody's conference call? You might think, what could be the perception of this? Yeah, it's distracting. I could be bored, exactly. So my recommendation is actually get a chair where the top is lower than you are. So you're only seeing your, your upper body. Ideally, you'd have something totally blank behind you. And then you can use these techniques. Now I wanna say that I completely understand we are all working under difficult circumstances in this new world of video. Uh, I don't always have the perfect setup. Right, I don't. I I I didn't follow my own advice with the chair because, frankly, 
it's the one that fits into this space. And the rest of my house is filled with people and I can't go to any of my other, other places. But if there is a, a, something that you, you really need to make an impact, this is something you really care about, then it is worth thinking about where you're sitting or standing, what that background is and how you're lit. So I've invested in a ring light from Amazon. It cost me 20 pounds uh, and it's pretty brilliant actually. Okay, we're gonna move on here. So the next thing to think about when you are speaking is the volume. We can't have physical energy without vocal energy and we can't have vocal energy without volume. Now, some people may say, well, you know, you're sitting right next to the, the microphone. Surely you don't need to shout. I completely agree. I don't need to hear you shout. But it is really interesting that you cannot reach the lower tones in your voice, those tones that we know have gravitas, impact, make people like you more, if you don't speak louder. Another really useful technique is emphasis. And what I mean by emphasis is if I were going to underline and bold every word, right? So that's what I mean by emphasis. This is an incredibly useful technique for slowing you down. If you find in one of these meetings that you are rabbiting on, you're going into rabbit holes of detail, you're giving too much information, I love emphasis because it signals to the audience that you want them to hear this, but you're also giving your brain a moment to catch up. So it goes really well with the pause. These two are my favorite techniques. If somebody, for example, asks me a question that I'm not sure how I'm gonna answer, one thing I'll do, is I'll ask a question back if it's not a webinar. If, I'm, if I can ask the question live, I'll say, well, tell me a little bit more about what you mean. And then I'll repeat their question back to them with some emphasis and pauses, giving myself time to think, and then I'll have a go at answering it. So that's a, these are, incredibly useful techniques that I find you can combine in a hybrid world, in a digital world, and in person as well. So finally, this is around moving your voice around. So we've all been in those calls where somebody's droning on like this at one tone and you think you might, you just can't take it anymore. This is about moving your voice up and down so that it, it feels like there's a lot of different, um, a lot of different tones is the wrong word. It's, there's a lot of different notes. So we have something like three, two or three octaves in our voice, even as non-professional singers. But we use a small percentage of those when textures, lovely, good, I love that word. We use a small percentage of, of our vocal tone when we are in business mode, and we use even a tiny percentage of them when we're under pressure. So this is about imagining your voice as a ball and throwing it up in the air. Uh, in reality, as a way to practice this, I'd encourage you to use it with words like, so, and, because. And it gives, as Hannah Laura says, uh, some vocal variety. It's such a gift, your voice, but it can be one of those things that we just don't use enough of. Uh, okay, so those are the energy techniques. These are really useful in person. I think they're even more useful on screen because all the time we're trying to hook, keep our audience engaged. We're trying to appear confident and comfortable. All of these techniques are really useful for appearing confident and comfortable. And what's really important is to remember that even if you're not feeling confident, 
even if you are not, even if you're feeling nervous, these are some good ways to help cover those nerves, to help cover that you might be feeling rather uncomfortable. So now that we've cracked the 90%, uh, I wanna talk a little bit about um, how we deal with that 10%. How do you deal with the, um, the content? How do you become memorable and interesting? So if I were gonna tell you about my last holiday, it was such a long time ago. If I were gonna tell you about my last holiday, and I were to say, ah, oh, there's three key things I'd like to tell you about my trip to France. The first is the travel and transportation to the Provençal region. Second is the quality of the fruit you might find there. And the third, oh my God, I would never get to the third because you would have fallen asleep by that point, right? talks like that when we're we're telling each other about our our holidays but somehow when we get into work mode when we get into presentation mode over the screen it get it can get back to well there's three key things i'd like to tell you now i would never tell you not to have three messages i think that steve jobs was right i think that people can remember about three things but I do think that there can be a more interesting way to tell, to give your messages. And especially if we don't have the, the opportunity to be in the room with people, to see how things are landing, I believe that there's a great structure you can use and it has elements of what we all know to be engaging, which is stories. So if I were really to tell you about my last holiday, I'd say, do you know what? I was so tired of being on Zoom calls that I put my computer in my suitcase and I did not take it out for the first week. I sat by the pool and I read one detective novel after the other. And for a break, I would go to the river and jump off of a rock in the river. That was it. That was my holiday. I loved it. So all I've done is I pick a couple of pictures to put into your mind. Now, quite often on these kind of calls, we are, are doing presentations, so there's already something to look at on screen. But sometimes we're not, right? Sometimes we're just talking, it's just us. So what I love about the story structure is that it gives you elements of the story that you can use to, to build pictures in people's minds. And we know that most people are visual learners. Something like 60 or 70% of us really learn best with pictures. Now, if you don't have a picture to put on the screen and I'm just looking at you, you can still be memorable by painting those descriptive pictures in my mind. What do I mean by that? So in the middle is the storyteller. And when I say I, I do mean I, I don't mean we. Now I am not telling you never to use we. Of course, you have to use we. But what I do mean is that think about those characters in your story. Use their names. So if you're talking about a project at work, talk about the, the person who led that project or talk about the team who led that project. The point about using I is that it makes the whole thing more personal. It can be very difficult to listen to a Zoom conversation where the person goes on and on about, here's the things we did, here's the things that we accomplished. When I'm wondering why that person is speaking, why isn't someone else speaking? Who is this we? So what does every story have? This is a baby question. At the very basic level, what does every story have? Yes, a beginning, a middle, and an end. It takes you on a journey. If you have time to plan your presentation, if you're doing a presentation online, I always think 
about what is that journey I need to take people on. So specifically in, in a presentation, I think about three things. I think, what do I need? What do I want the audience to feel? And I write those emotions down. Then I think, what do I need them to know? And I make sure I write those messages down. And then finally, I think, what do I want the audience to do? And that quite often fits me, creates a journey for me to plan my presentation. So I think that for every message you give, a useful way to illustrate that message is to tell a little anecdote. Give me an example of what you're talking about. There's so much easier to listen to uh, an example than a broad subject. Or a mini story, like my holiday. Sometimes if there's a drier or more technical detail, I think analogies are fantastic. So when I first started at Bloomberg TV, I had no idea what I was doing. It was like going over a waterfall in a barrel. I was barely hanging on. After a while, the barrel landed. I didn't fall out. I got the hang of it. So again, it's all about those pictures that you put into people's mind. Why? Why does it matter? Because we know that we can, the brain can retain about seven words at a time. But if you show somebody a picture or give them something to think about that is a detailed image, they can remember it for up to six to seven months. The other thing about using these kind of examples, mini stories, is that it really helps to personalize your content. So it really helps to help the audience get to know you a bit more. So if I'm speaking to a group of people that I've never met, just like I am here, any little bit that I can give out of myself helps you to start build a relationship with me. And that's true for any digital uh, conversation. It's also true in real life. So there are always facts. I'm always interested in, in the facts of what you have to tell me. But what I really remember and start to resonate with is the emotion. So I'm worried about the effect of COVID-19 on the events business. I'm really proud that I've started to pivot to be able to do things online. I'm excited to be here today. If in doubt of how to start a presentation online, or in person for that matter, don't be afraid to start with an emotion. I'm delighted to be here. Because what it does is it starts to turn on the mirror neurons, the mir mirror rather than, I don't know, M-I-R-R-O-R. -R -R. It starts to turn on the mirror neurons in people's brains. We reflect emotions back. So if I'm, it's just like as, um, as when I'm speaking, if I'm speaking with some passion, if I'm using the energy techniques, you start to reflect uh, that way. You, if I use these emotions, you, your brain also hooks onto them. They help you give your personal opinion. They help the audience get to know you but they also help the audience know what's important. So for each message that you might give, I would really encourage you to use, um, to use an element of this story structure. So of course, for every presentation, I'm not expecting somebody to have brilliant stories at every talk, you know, every turn of the, um, of the page or of the presentation, but these are tools that you can use when it feels comfortable or when it feels like um, when it feels like you need a, a place to, to either spice it up or a place to really drive something home. So these are this is the other half, right? So this is the the ten percent of the um, of the of the presentation of the 
of the speech, whatever it is that's the content. I really love this because it's useful for almost any time you open your mouth. So if I'm giving a, an introduction to a panel, for example, I will, I'll start with an emotion. So I'll say, I'm really delighted to be here. I give a fact. Um, I might tell a mini analogy. So this panel is a little bit like, you know, going into the, the French patisserie and getting the choice between all the different eclairs. There could not be a more perfect moment. I don't think that's a great analogy actually, but, um, but I do try to use these, uh, these as I go every, every communication I have. Right, I think that is enough of me talking. Um, oh, the final thing, plain language. So I know that each one of you comes from a different part of the world. You also come from a different sector, a different industry and you all have your own jargon. I would really encourage you to speak to, as if you were speaking to a teenager. So as if you were speaking to an intelligent teenager. At Bloomberg TV, they used to tell us to speak to dopes and pros at the same time. So they'd say, speak to the head of PIMCO bond fund at the same time as you're speaking to Aunt Edna, who's worried about her, her pension. And I have found it to be a really useful technique. I remember when I interviewed the head of CERN, uh, the nuclear physics laboratory, he said, if I don't have enough people studying physics, I physically won't have the people I need to discover what dark matter is. So he could have wowed me with Higgs bosons and quarks but his message was very simple. Einstein, to stay on the physics theme, Einstein said that he spoke to the head of the university and the man who came to pick up his garbage with the same language. And if you look at the really good speakers, President Obama, President Clinton, Steve Jobs, who I mentioned before, they never used a word that an intelligent 18 year old wouldn't use. So it's something to think about. I think now it is perhaps time for some questions. So where are my questions? Here they are. So if you've got, um, if you've got questions, just start popping them in the chat and I will, um, I will start working my way down from the top. So is a green screen with a virtual background or a room divider behind you better on a Zoom call? So I have just purchased a green screen. It's five foot by seven. It's so large uh, and it has taken me, I've, I've now bought three lights. Um, and I've now emceed two conferences on it. And I have, the feedback I've received is that it's great. It works really well. Uh, it does take some space and it takes some setup time. So <laughs> in my case, I can't do it there tonight because it's where my entire family is eating dinner is where I have that set up. Um, I, um, I also, um, if I can, I just put a very plain background up. So if I, if I, if I have, to, by the way, on the back of my green screen, I never have anything except a color. And so quite often if I'm in a, um, if it's a, it's a less than desirable background and your lighting is good, so if you're able to even get a little clip on light for your computer, um, then just put a plain background behind you. Um, the, the, of course, people understand, right? We all understand that we're working in challenging times. The, the more you have more impact when the focus is just on you 
rather than on everything else in the screen. Because I'm not just looking at you usually on a screen, I'm usually looking at four to eight other people. And there's a lot of distractions that can go on. So do I have tips specifically for job interviews? Um, I'm assuming that this is job interviews online, but actually it probably doesn't matter, job interviews. Um, so I do have tips for job interviews. Um, I would take, when I, when I train people who are, who are going for job interviews, we, um, I ask them to bring their CV and then for each item on the, each job that they've had before, we try to work out three different mini stories to tell because we know that there are now quite typical um, questions that you get asked in a job interview, right? So you might get something like, so what do you, oh, what's a good job interview question? Um, what are you really good at? So take the experience, take one of the experiences that you've been given and work out a mini story that you can tell about that. Um, equally for what do you find really, what do you find really challenging? What are you not so good at? So find something on your CV that tells, puts you in a good light, but allows you to then, um, to then say something that you're still working on. So quite often uh, with, my, uh, with my clients, we, we, we talk about, well, you know, I, I quite often have, um, have issues presenting on screen and therefore I've started working on this issue. Um, the more examples you can give about that, in, that answer the question, but they answer it with your experience, it doesn't matter how much experience you've had. If you've had very little, just take the things that you've done and, and find ways to answer the question. Another you know, question that quite often comes up in job interviews is why do you wanna work here? And so of course you've done your research on the company that you're, or the, the group that you wanna interview with or that you're interviewing with, but answering with some of your experience so I really love your company because it offers this. And I learned from when I was working with this company that I was really passionate about that subject. Um, I do have more in my book, um, which there's a link to that on my website, um, but I would encourage you to do, to, to look at examples. Okay, the document script outline referring causes the eye shifting issue. Let me just read this one. Yes, okay, so this is a really important thing about where you look when you're looking um, digitally. <clears throat> Excuse me. Ideally, you would be looking at the camera the whole time because that's the only way it looks like you're making eye contact. Now that is impossible, right? So what I do is I have, <clears throat> I either, if I, if I have paper, um, I prop it up um, next to me so that I'm looking either to the side or down below, but I then look back at the camera. Um, there's another, depending on the software, this doesn't work for every video conference, but Sometimes I make the, the Zoom call into the top half. So I've got, for example, the people that I'm looking at just along the, the top of the screen. And then in the bottom half, I've got um, my notes. So I'm, I'm looking at the screen and I'm looking away, but then I can, quick, I can also look back at the camera. Um, by the way, um, if uh, that my technique for eye contact in real life is imagine you are out in your garden with a watering can. So each plant gets a little bit of attention versus being out in the garden with a hose 
where nobody really gets the attention, right? So in some ways it's easier on screen because you know exactly where you have to look. In other ways, it's harder because you also need to be able to read, to look at people if you can see them. Um, so my rule is spend, if I'm in speaking mode, I try to spend at least 60 to 70% looking at the camera. And then I also do look down. The pause, by the way, and emphasis will help you because in the pause, you can look down and then come back to the screen. Okay, there is a question about voice and exercises. Yes, there are exercises. Do you know what? I love the exercises that the National Theatre, the um, UK National it's called just called the National Theatre. And if you search for vocal exercises, National Theatre UK, you'll be sent to um, some YouTube videos where they look at breathing. They look at throwing the voice. So you start at the top and you come down. Uh, and um, and then you go from the, the bottom to the top again. So there are, um, and I, when I've practiced these with clients, you have to be prepared to feel a little bit ridiculous, but they are really fun. Um, the other thing you can do is, is, is take those bridging words. So take words like so, and, because, and just practice throwing the voice with those and see what happens. And you'll find that there's more tone than you almost expect to have. Once you get used to doing it with those words, then actually you find that any word, you can move your, your voice around. So I like to imagine that my, the vowels are the river, and the consonants are the banks of that river and they help to move the vowels around. In fact, the theater coach at the National Theater says that the vowels contain the emotion and the consonants just hold those words together. So that's an interesting way to think about if I wanna get that passion in, that's also how would I do it besides the, besides, um, using an example that might show passion. It's another way to use it is in the vocal tone. Okay. The, in a working, oh, the name again of the site for the, that was the National Theater of the, in the UK. You can email me and I can, um, I can, or tweet me and I can send it to you too. Um, in a working environment, People attending um, are just not heard the same way as the ones attending in. Oh, so is this, are you, Alexander, are you talking about in, um, in, in a hybrid situation so that when you've got some people there and some people in person and some people on, on video? Yes. So it's hard. Right, um, and part of the host job. So, so one thing is to if you're if you're hosting these meetings, imagine that you've got everyone at at a dinner party that you're hosting. So you have to make everybody feel comfortable, and therefore it's important for you as the host to turn to the screen and ask people for people's um, input, as it is to. Um, to to engage with the people who are who are actually in the room. I oh do we are we out of time? I'm, I can see that people are raising their hand. Um, so I think if you're on the if you're on the video screen, you have to be 
ready to come in at any given moment. So, and my advice is to come in earlier rather than wait uh, because you set the tone for yourself in a meeting quite early on. Uh, Madeline Albright always said that, or says that, I read in her book that, that the earlier she came in in the meeting, the more she found she was brought back in later. So it's something to think about. How can I avoid long pauses? Oh, think pauses. You know what's really interesting about a pause? My rule about pausing is pause three times as often as you think you need to for three times as long. What feels like an eternity to you is usually a millisecond. The other thing that is really useful is to film yourself. So if you are practicing your speech ahead of time, practice the pause and see if it did actually come out that long, if it came out too long. Usually it comes out and it just looks like you were doing it for effect. You were doing it because you wanted the audience to get this point. The other thing to think about with pauses is that they really don't work if there's no energy around them. I mean, that would just be totally boring, right? So you have to have all the other elements of, the, uh, of, of performance energy when you're pausing. So you do have to continue to use emphasis, the volume, throwing the voice. So what do I think about Toastmasters? I think it's a great forum to, uh, to, to practice in. Uh, and I think that any, any, any forum that you can practice telling stories, practice standing up on your feet, practice giving a speech, I think is brilliant. My computer is um, on top of, well, I don't think I, if I take it, the books are gonna fall. I've actually got, so I'm at a desk and I've got about 20 centimeters. Basically I've got my, my computer at eye level. So I'm looking directly into the camera. Um, actually, I, I'm, when I'm building my, building my studio with the help of a documentary filmmaker who's a friend, uh, and he actually has advised me to have the camera just a little bit above and have the light shining um, down in the back of me as well as on me so that there's just a tiny, tiny bit of shadow underneath the chin. And apparently, according to him, I literally learned this two days ago. So you guys are the first to get this information. That is the, um, that's the best in terms of a, uh, of how, of, that's the best camera angle in terms of ease of watching for you, the viewer. Um, there's one that's come through on the, the chat, which is the last one. How do you prepare yourself to be comfortable? So do you know what I do? If I'm doing a really big event, I make myself as large as possible beforehand. So I stand up, I put my arms out, and then I, I go. Um, you obviously can't do this in front of everybody else. It has to be while the, the camera's off, uh, but it is a really useful tip. And again, Amy Cuddy's, um, if, you, if you want, tweet me, um, or send me an email and I can send you the link to her, um, to her presentation or to her, to her TED talk. It's really useful. There's other elements that you can do. Um, if, I am, if I feel nervous, I'll stop and I'll take five minutes ahead of time to do some breathing and I'll count through uh, the things that I always feel. Um, it's C-U-D-D-Y, Amy Cuddy. Um, and if you put in Amy Cuddy TED Talk, you'll get a link to her TED Talk and there's actually a, um, there's a transcript as well. So um, yeah, I'll do some mindful breathing. Um, I will, um, if I'm really nervous that I, um, if I'm really nervous, I will also 
and, and I'm live. So if something happens, and for example, the, the tech fails, like I'm emceeing an event and two people, the two people who are on the panel have dropped off, which has happened. And if I find that my brain is um, stuck, I will curl my toes. And if you do it right now, you'll feel it feels really uncomfortable. Okay, you can release them now, release the toes. All it does is it snaps your brain from being up here, like worried about what's going on here into your body and it brings you back to the present. So that's a good technique for, for when you are in kind of mid flow and something happens that you weren't expecting. It's a good way to get your brain from being in kind of brain freeze mode back into your body. So we have um, come to the end of our session together. I really loved being with you guys. I think it's fantastic how much engagement you can get even without seeing you in person. So I would love to keep in touch, keep in touch with me on social media, send me an email if I can give you a hand with any speech or online communication and I hope to see you again at one of these events in the near future. Thank you so much.